is Dr. Stephen Tsang, Columbia University. Stephen has a long career in genome engineering and is an expert in stem cells. He was active in phototransduction uh, in the early 1990s. He was one of the first to produce knockouts, mouse knockouts. Uh, a particular topic was a PDE gamma knockout. PDE gamma, as many of you probably don't know, is an inhibitor and its knockout actually decreased the activity of PDE, which was a very surprising result at the time. So he, uh, Stephen Zhang, is an expert in many, many different topics, CRISPR-Cas9, viral vectors, proteomics, uh, non-invasive uh, imaging, gene therapy. So he's a really versatile clinician scientist, and he's, he's uh, giving a presentation today on genotyping of patients without HiSeq X10, which is a whole genome sequencing method. All right, Steve, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Wolfgang, for the uh, generous introduction, and also thank for the opportunity uh, to visit uh, the Moran Eye Center. So it, uh, for the residents and fellows, this is a, a clinical case presentation. It's similar to uh, Forcing Conference, how, 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 I guess, how Paul and I learned it at uh, Joe Stein, Forcing Conference style. So just imagine that you are in a busy morning clinic. Uh, so every time you see a scene, a picture of Columbia, means that there's a new patient walking to your, uh, your office. So I advertise that we have a Anybody interested in genome engineering on Saturday before AVO? Mostly by people that know a lot more than I do, but from, uh, from uh, uh, Bruce Cochran and Howie Wang, they, they, uh, they, they hold a record in terms of engineering IPS efficiency, and Howie Wang in terms of uh, they, nobody can do CRISPR uh, knocking in, uh, in mouse oversight for more than 4 KB. So Chris, uh, they still hold a record. So to summarize, in case uh, you need to get paged out, if you get paged out uh, during the uh, case presentations, this is the, uh, the uh, summary. So it's unusual. So I have, uh, I have inquired in ophthalmology. You can, uh, at beginning residents, you should feel uh, fortunate in, uh, in this part of medicine, that you can look at the patient and you know exact what nucleotide change the patient has just by your clinical examination. You do not need to do sequencing. Sequencing is just for confirmation. And I posed this question to Victor Mercusic, uh, that what areas in internal medicine that you can look at the patient and know what the, what the nucleotide change, just by, just by clinical examination alone. And he can come up with the achondroplasia. So 99% of patients, if you make a clinical diagnosis of achondroplasia, it's going to have this uh, 380 residue change in the fiber uh, growth factor receptor three. In progeria, you make a diagnosis of progeria, 80% of the patient is going to have this uh, mutation in the laminin A gene, in the 1824 residue. And then the, 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 the some, the, some conditions, but in ophthalmology, I will show you that there they, are they more than a dozen uh, conditions in the retina. You can look at the patient, you know what residue the patient has. Sometimes you can look at the patient, you do not know what residue, but you can narrow down to what gene it is. For example, in, uh, you make a uh, diagnosis of congenital fibrosis, you know that this is going to give 21A gene. The list is growing, the, the number of genes causing RP, so I would try to convince you that you do. Uh, I've seen uh, patients that went in the, in the East Coast, patients get a uh, consultation in many different uh, clinics. In, in Boston, they seem to like uh, DNA sequencing, uh, exome sequencing as a primary technique to make a diagnosis. I'll tell you that maybe you can be more cost efficient. Just look at the patient first, do, do a few candidate genes before you do to whole genome or whole exome uh, sequencing. The reason we need to know the gene is because uh, many times now we had uh, better genotype phenotype correlation ships then we can now uh, make, uh, give the patient a prognosis. And of course, this is important for family uh, genetic counseling, pre-symptomatic counseling, or carrier detection. And most likely in the next, uh, next two decades, gene therapy is gene-specific, so you need to know the gene before gene therapy can be applied. As we know more and more about the, uh, 
the phenotype, then we uh, collect your genotype, and they can go back and inform us what kind of phenotype uh, we expect when a, um, a patient has a certain genotype and vice versa. So the, for beginning resident, we will do a couple of uh, imaging techniques to help us to discern the genotype just by uh, in the clinic. So typically, if you would use uh, the government uh, program, iGene, for, to do DNA testing, it may take four years before you get results. So but now, a lot of times, you can look at the patient. You can give the patient result at the, uh, at the end of the day. So this is all the fluorescent imaging. We'll focus uh, because some of the work done by Janice Sparrow. We do a quite a lot of other fluorescent uh, imaging. This is infrared free. This is how fundoscopy looks like. And this is uh, infrared. So the first patient comes to consultation. Who has the pointer? OK, you can describe. So this is patient come for consultation. They want to know whether or not they want to take vitamins. This fundus picture. So the patient wants to know whether or not he should be taking vitamins. So if auto for us imaging would it help? And this is a very characteristic pattern. It gives a petaloid, like a clover leaf kind of atrophy, a punctate hyperfluorescent. So bullseye, by definition, has to be a continuous atrophy. So the atrophy has to join each other. So this is, this, unlike, unlike what the bullseye manual wrote, this is not exactly bullseye atrophy. Bullseye has to be a continuous atrophy, by definition. So this is a little bit, kind of a little bit spotty. And the, the atrophy, they don't join each other. So by bullseye, they will join each other. So in the, in the, in the clinic, some, sometimes uh, we, we need to look at other family members. So the daughter came with the father. Is he symptomatic? You want to describe the picture 2015 vision for the daughter, the right eye? Uh, there is some RPG changes in the uh, central macula as well. And so, and the left eye? Uh, there's some similar RPG changes in the central macula. So, all the fluorescent helps to, to discern. This is a asymptomatic daughter, 2015 vision. You can also this kind of uh, uh, speckled hyperfluorescent around the area. So we, we, we generally do electrodiagnostic, and ERG testing was normal. So th this is actually a, uh, this will be sufficient to tell the residue. So any, any suggestion what condition first? You, you remember the paper, then this is what the uh, characteristic phenotype described by Adam Bird and Tony Moore. At least the diagnosis, the name of the conditions. So, um, there's a couple different possibilities. Yeah, yes. What's, what's most likely, though? This, this is very characteristic the pickled, uh, speckled hyperfluorescent and the clover leaf type of pattern atrophy. So this is a, this was first, this was, the gene was described by a neurologist, unfortunately, <laughs> not by ophthalmologist. So this is, a, this is a, the residue is 172 of the LDS. So this is very characteristic. They are, they, no matter, if you see this, this sort of uh, punctate out of hyperfluorescent and with a clover leaf type of pattern atrophy, this, this is a, a RDS peripherent. So this is a form of pattern macular dystrophy. And in this case, it's very specific to this 172 residue. I'm not sure why, but this is how all the patients with this 172 residue will show up at this, uh, this uh, well, diagnosis. Otherwise, with RDS peripherent, you can see almost any other thing. Yeah. That's the problem. With RDS peripherent, you can use RP or also pattern yeah. dystrophy. Yeah, but this residue gives you it's very specific phenotype. So a different patient, you can, you can pass your, your pointer to your, to your neighbor. Another patient came for a consultation. 
2420, 240 vision. It's a fundus picture. And then you need to notice that there's a drusen on nasal side of this. Anybody want to describe this picture? And so, so we've got the photographs, the whole eye. So looking at the right eye, there, around the optic nerve, it looks like there's some around the nerve. Yeah, so nasal side is very characteristic. So most of the time, you don't see drusen on nasal side, on the disc. And then, uh, so it's kind of felt that there's whiteness in the entire macula. And then it looks like, it looks like they're drusen or drusenoid. And uh, some yellowish discoloration as you get towards the center of the globe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some on the. A little bit high, higher, Mac. How do you describe this pattern of Drusen? But that's not so characteristic. But then, characteristic one is the one on the this. But this, what do you call this kind of Drusen? Um, Stephen, I know the Drusen on the right eye. Yeah. Uh, nasal too. Yeah, both eyes both are nasal. There's some nasal on the disc. So it's just uh, di diagnostic for this condition. And you should maybe even know the residues of the, of the gene. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm not sure the exact word that you're using to describe this pattern, but it's kind of almost stellate or, or projecting out. Yeah, so it kind of, it, it's called radio, by the way. Radio, yeah. So you, can, you, can, you can see that on the disc. This auto, so usually uh, AMD Drusen, AMD Drusen usually do not hyperphoresce. For some reason, Drusen associated with macular dystrophy, they tend to hyperphoresce very well. And autofluorescent imaging. I think we'll see a little, maybe you can dim the lights in the front, you'll see a little bit better. This is infrared. High Mac, you can see kind of the radio pattern. These are the OCT. These are all the Drusen noid deposits. Right eye, left eye. You can, you can get some tubulation also. Does anybody want to suggest? I have, uh, we've discussed this before. Yeah. <laughs> no. Very good, very good. Yeah, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Europe, they call it uh, malatia in Europe. In, in the, in the, uh, the uh, Anglo-Saxon speaking world, then it's called Doin Sanicom, described by Professor Doin in Oxford. But in Europe, the, because of the, uh, this is a uh, Swiss-Italian uh, uh, valley. So they all, they all have this mutation in this uh, fibrillant, um, I think a fibrillant, uh, uh, Five gene is uh, EG, EGF containing fibrillin like exosalum uh, matrix motif. And everybody is going to have this 345 residue with this mutation. So, a different patient drews in on nasal side of the disc. We, we, even, we even have two families in, in uh, Washington Heights in Manhattan. So, some, sometimes the family do not know that they, they, are, they are somehow originated from Switzerland. But they have a big pedigree in Iowa and also a big pedigree in. Um, in around Oxford, yeah, where Professor Doyne had worked. So yeah, so the 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 the, the knock-in mice in a single allele has almost no phenotype. Only the double dominant has a phenotype. Double dominant. So in pa in patients is dominant one allele, but in mouse you need two allele to see phenotype. So this is just a, another patient. You, you can see. I think this one is actually from uh, Washington. She lives around Washington Heights in, uh, upper Manha in uh, uptown Manhattan. So you see Drusen on the nasal side of the disc also. Of course, around the Drusen, you get a little bit decreased sensitivity on microperimetry testing. So now you can pass on your pointer to a, a different patient. This, this one, actually, I took it from the internet, from some, some grand rounds case, which, but I do not agree with the diagnosis of someone posted their grand rounds on the website. Yeah. So right eye. So the patient came for diabetic screening. That's very typical. These patients usually come for diabetic screening. Vision is excellent. Every time, this is not my patient. This is a token from somebody else's grand round. 
But the, this patient typically, they don't know why when they come to the eye clinic that there's, there's a long line of resident and fellow want to look at them. And, and, and the vision is very excellent, 2020 20 usually. Anyone want to describe this patient? So there's, there's a forest scene. I've been in context of time. I went through the forest scene quickly. Yeah. So this is a classic presentation of something called like a window defect for the resin. When the RPE is gone, the window, you can see the choroid, RPE window. So in the, in the list of the, of the uh, some, somebody else grand round presentation they posted on the web, these are the differential diagnosis that they offer. But I don't, uh, I don't agree with any one of them, though. <laughs> so, so this and then uh, this is uh, this is uh, one of my patients. You can want to describe it. I, I think they have the same diagnosis, although I cannot genotype the the uh, patient from the internet. <laughs> yeah, but I think they have the same diagnosis. Again, there's areas of atrophy, and there's a little more atrophy, but areas like atrophy around the phobia. Uh, not, yeah, not much atrophy around the phobia. Right, sorry. Yeah, there's a name for this also. There's a, there's a name for this kind of uh, pattern of atrophy. The right eye, the left eye. It's similar again, you just have this kind of ring of atrophy. Yeah. So early, it's kind of the mid phase of the thoracene. Just want to show you at the end. Uh, yeah. So the sister also has some similar problem. So well, when you describe this, this is autofluorescent imaging. Um, so in the autofluorescence, you see corresponding to the areas of atrophy and then corresponding to the atrophy, you just have the hyper and hypo autofluorescence, or fickle hyper and hypo autofluorescence. So usually for the resident that, yeah, if you wait a minute, maybe five more years later, the area that hyperfluorescent will be the area that's going to be at atrophy, usually. In, it it, it kind of suggests where the future atrophy is going to be, hyperfluorescence. So it's also spare the central fovea in, in, uh, in, this, in this patient also. This is another patient with the same, same, same condition. And it, so it, it also stares, uh, try to spare the, the um, central fovea. In the left eye. And also, uh, for these deposits on the nasal side, also, the, this is also not, not quite common for, for in terms of uh, for other kinds of genes. But for this one, it's more common. Does anybody want to suggest what this is? What the patient has? Okay, we can see a couple more cases, though. I guess this, we saw this one already. So this is this, this is a maternal inherited diabetes and deafness. So the, this is called annual atrophy. It's it's, it's said to sp uh, spare the central fovea. Usually they come for the. It's not uncommon though. Maybe five percent of patients they come through the diabetic screening. They have they have this, but they are usually asymptomatic. They do not. They will not develop hemorrhages. They would not develop the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And it's called maternal. So the problem is this is in the mitochondria. So sometimes it may or may not, because of the threshold effect, it depends on the number of mutations in the, in the retina, the number of mutations in the, in the cochlea, in the number of mutations in the, I guess, in the, in the, maybe in the pancreas, that they, they may not all have uh, hearing loss and they may not all have uh, 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 retina finding. But you make a diagnosis, uh, everybody will have this uh, 3243 residue in the tRNA leucine gene. Sometimes, sometimes this mitochondrial DNA, sometimes it's difficult to capture by whole exome sequencing. So you send a patient for whole exome sequencing, you may miss it. Unless you tell the lab you're looking for mitochondrial uh, DNA. So the whole exome sequencing uh, for clear testing costs about $6,000. You just do one residue, it's going to be less than $100, maybe like $40. So it's a little more cost efficient. For some reason, in Boston, they like to do whole exome sequencing. Steve, on a regular yeah. study in back 
No, even, uh, a long time, long time, maybe 70, 78, 70, 70 years old, the fovea fat mecca stay intact. So you call, uh, this is called annual atrophy, by the way. Right? This is called annual atrophy. This is a uh, patient referred to me by John Flint. I'm going to describe this. So we've got a famous photograph here of uh, the right eye. And in the macro, you can see some dark tissue changes and uh, yellow uh, fovea. And then you can just kind of know what that's doing. And then also some skin and any nerve is awake. So do, what do you think of the nerve? How about, how about outside the nerve? Peripeptor. Yeah, peripeptor. Yeah. This is a right eye and this is a left eye. This is a, a three year old child. Uh, so, again, similar um, mark almost half a year around the, the nerve is affected and then just more, more mild changes here. So, so, so notice that, how to describe this, the shape of the atrophy. Maybe, maybe it's easier to see on infrared than other fluorescent. So I want to note, note to you that infrared imaging goes more deeper to the choroid. So you can see that this uh, uh, loss of choroid. Other fluorescent mostly is from the retinal pigmented epithelium, RPE. So this is actually quite intact on the RPE. And that gives you a clue of what, where the gene is supposed to express. So this gene probably initially affects the choroid before the RPE. OCT is not too special, so in the context of time, I'll go through that quickly, other than just uh, the so, 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 uh, loss of RPE. So the, 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 the patient was sending this, this could it be uh, toxo? So anybody agree? Toxoplasmosis. We, we can uh, look at the mother first. Mother is asymptomatic. They're from New Jersey, though. They're from New Jersey. The family's on there. But, but typically, typically the, it's more common in certain parts of the world. Yeah, I'll tell you which, where, where later. But patients from New Jersey. The right eye, left eye? You want to just describe the left eye? I need to point out the differential if to, to help you for the differential diagnosis. There's no cells in the vitreous in this patient at all. In both the, in both the, uh, the, the, the child and, and the mother. And grandma, I saw grandma later. This is still the, the, uh, the, the mom. So, so you, 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 this will radio the, the white area, the hyperfluorescent area, essentially will be the future part of the atrophy. So these patients, maybe by the time they're 80, it will affect the fovea. But typically, it's asymptomatic. Left eye. You can see that the, uh, the, there's some names uh, for this, though. Now, how the, the term that uh, the radios up. So loss of RPE, you can see the choroidal shadowing uh, much better. There. So we did, we, did, we did electrodiagnostic also. So the electrodiagnostic is pretty normal mm -hmm. for both mom and, and grandmother. Grandmother looks the same also. We saw grandmother. Does anybody want to suggest what this could be? I, I give you a, it's, it's more common in Iceland, but the, the, the parents, the, the uh, patients from New Jersey, it's more common in Iceland. There's many different names for this condition, though. So, uh, one, one of the, uh, the reason I brought this case up because the, in the grand rounds presentation of, uh, the, from the internet, where they, they, they said they was, they said their case could be atrophic areata, but, but the diagnosis for this patient is, is, uh, is atrophic areata. There's one of the names, but they have other names also. He also called the uh, circumpervary dysgenesis of the pigment epithelium. I think this is a misnomer, and I'll show it to you that this is not a pigment epithelial disease, this is probably a choroidal disease. So there's another name, it's called helicoidal peripeptal choroidal retinoid uh, degeneration. There's no cells in the vitreous and the patients are young, but it's on a differential, you need to consider the serpiginous because of the uh, tongue-like lesions radiating out from the disc. 
Someone, I think this is a, uh, we take uh, uh, donor eye bank, and also one is from the uh, mouse. Yeah, I think this, this is from the eye bank, and this is from the mouse. Looking at antibody to this gene, the, this is a transcription factor called TNET, TNET1. This uh, transcription factor is not, found in, is not found in the RPE. So, so this is, is a misnomer. So it cannot be a dysgenesis of the pigment epithelium. And then auto fluorescent imaging, I showed to you earlier that the RPE looks intact in the child. But it's expressed high in the choroid and the neurosensory retina, also expressed in the uh, muscle. Also, is in, this is the, uh, from mouse, and this is from human, from eye bank. So it's not in the RPE. It's, it's found in the choroid. So I, this time, I'll give you a clue where the patient come from. And, and they will give you the, uh, the gene, kind of, because this is not found so, uh, in other ethnic groups. Yeah, so typically they don't have symptoms until they're close to 60. And, and the, the, the name for this condition contain, contain this feature. There's a little. You look at the periphery, yeah. So, so the pigment are deep, so they don't have pigment migration. Typically photoreceptor disease, you will get pigment migration. This one don't have much pigment migration. Or the, the pigment are kind of deep. You, can, you cannot tell unless you do uh, with a 90 diopter lens, so there's not much pigment migration. The, 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 the pigment are kind of deep in the, in the, uh, in the RPE level. So the, this, this is a typical like, scalloped type of atrophy. So for, uh, so, uh, for, for Randy, I bought a lens, uh, anterior segment photo. <laughs> so what do you think of the lens? So the problem is that in, in New York, a lot of times these patients have, are pseudo fakic already. So, <laughs> so, so, so it's difficult. But this one, at least you can see the. So what do you think of the lens? Any of the residents? Um, the lens. There are some radial lines on the <laughs> so what are these? What are, what are those? What are those? Like no. So the foliage will be more kind of like cloudy, right? Yes. Yeah, it's on this and so they're quite anterior. Really. So in the combination of this fundus, uh, fundus photo finding, anybody has a diagnosis? And so the choroideremia or atrophy? Yeah, that's, that's on the differential. It's very good. Why wouldn't this be choroideremia? Do, do, yeah, why would this be no, choroideremia? I'm asking the right yeah. answer. Why? <laughs> I don't know if it was on the first slide, but I'll tell you that it's unlikely to be choroideremia. Not that he was Scottish. Yes, yeah, <laughs> his, his father was affected. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, so that right. should not be choroideremia. Yeah. That's excellent. But yeah. if I would show you that, uh, yeah, it, could be. it would be a very yeah. high in your differential. When you look yes. Up. And gyrate after, what's the inheritance of gyrate after? Okay, so again. Yeah. But what are conditions you get this uh, zone news inserted so anteriorly? Yeah. So these are autofluorescent imaging. It just will highlight the center. They're now you see choroidal autofluorescent. Choroidal autofluorescent. So this is uh, called LOT late onset retinal degeneration. And once you make a diagnosis a lot, this is dominant, then you know that everybody is going to have the, uh, this 163 residue in the CTRP5 gene. The gene is still unknown, but it dimerized with another interesting gene that I'll talk about this afternoon, the membrane bristle related protein. So the, the uh, onset is quite late for these patients, so they are not symptoms until like, in, almost in the 60s. And it, it, it behaves like retinitis pigmentosa. They typically have complaint of uh, nectanopia. And, and this is the, uh, the, the, the peripheral finding. It can look like choroideremia or, or gyrate, as Paul pointed out. 
So the, the, this is quite, uh, I think, the, maybe, does any other uh, condition give you this kind of insertion of lens anteriorly? Yeah, so to, to this is another one. You can look at the patient, you know what residue without sequencing, if you make a diagnosis. So this is just to distinguish some choroideremia. But the, 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 at least choroideremia may have some, some more of this bridging, sometimes get this bridging type of uh, preservation, uh, more, more common than late onset retinal degeneration. We'll skip through this. So now, now we, yeah, as I've gone over with you, at least for, for, this, for this part, you can look at the patient, you know what residue. Uh, so if you make a diagnosis of this uh, punctate, speckled uh, ring autofluorescent, and then with scallops atrophy in the center, this is most likely to be LDS peripheral 172. Actually, cases, this, uh, this is more common in Iceland, but uh, uh, my patient came from New Jersey. And uh, then the, you get uh, this transcription factor is uh, 421 once you make a diagnosis of uh, atrophic areata. The other name is called Stevenson's uh, choreal retinal atrophy. I'll show you an example of a maternal inherited diabetes and deafness. And once you make the diagnosis, you know that this is a uh, 3243 residue in this tRNA leucine gene. Door in honeycomb, once you make a diagnosis, you know that it's going to be fibrillin 3, uh, 345. Late onset retinal dystrophy, this just show you the CTRP5 gene. Um, I didn't have time to show you uh, most cases of sector RP in this country. It's going to be uh, rhodopsin protein, uh, HIS23. But now we're going to have some genes. We can, we can look at the patient. We do not know re residue, but at least you can have which gene. I'll show it to you. So there would be something, uh, in the example, similar to congenital fibrosis. Once you make a diagnosis of congenital fibrosis type 1, you know that this is the kinesin kif uh, 21 a gene. So this child is from uh, Greece, came for consultation. Uh, he is loaded with lots of steroid before, he, she, before I saw him. Vision uh, uh, pretty, uh, continued to drop and uh, loaded lots of steroid with no improvement. And then and, and, uh, you, you, vision become worse and worse. Want to describe this? So this is the color from this photograph of the right eye. And looking at the optic nerve, um, not, not very distinct margins. It doesn't look, el look elevated and swollen, but you just can't really find clear margins. It's kind of pale here uh, temporally. And then. So this, this particular condition like to affect the vessel uh, more, more than the other forms of retinal degeneration. And you can see, oh, didn't show so well. You can see some uh, exudate at the periphery. This, this is what we call Coates-like response. I'll show you some fluorescein picture later. So you can see, you can see there's some, some leakage at the periphery. In the context of time, I want to show you the most permanent uh, finding. So how to describe this? I'll show you the time uh, later sequence. Oops. For some reason, not all the forest scene popped up. I'll show up there. Let's see. Anyway, you, there's some yeah, extensive leakage at the periphery, but not all the. For some reason, not all the forest scene frames show up. But I show you the, the, the most important one. Maybe this may not be the best one. Is the left eye both eyes the same? It just, so what do you call this? Is this, is this a vein or artery? Um, Maybe that's a better picture. So for some reason, not all the pictures that I saw as I see on my computer didn't show up on the screen. So what do you call Yeah, so this is, this is a, this, why don't I tell you this is an artery and this is a vein? So what, what do you call this feature? Right, maybe this, is, this may be a better one. So this artery and this is a vein. There's some more leakage. Let's 
see. Wait, show you the uh, auto fluorescent imaging. Skip. Okay. So, so what do you call this? This is an artery. So this is auto fluorescent imaging. The uh, these are artery and these are veins. This is a different patient, by the way. But, uh, but this patient cooperate better, so I can get better auto fluorescent imaging. And the, the other feature is that what do you think of the retina on OCT? So I can tell you, this was described by John Hacken Lively, and this feature was described by Sam Jacobson. <laughs> so in the combination of this, you should know the gene, no? Yeah. <laughs> so ste steroid, steroid did not help. Well, of course, it came from the uveitis clinic, right? the referral in this patient. And then uh, this is, I think this is an, a, a, also a different patient. So you, 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 it's very common to have the edema also, the, the, this uh, group of conditions. And then you also see uh, the arteries are more spared compared to the vein. Maybe I made some more pictures. Yes. It shows up easy on all the fluorescent imaging. So veins are, the RP around the veins are affected, but the RP around the arterioles are not affected. So right eye, the left eye. So the, uh, the veins are affected, RP, and the arterioles are not affected. So there's no, no other gene will give you this kind of phenot uh, feature. Any suggestion what gene to this be? Uh, what's the what do you think the most likely diagnosis first? So this is, this is a... He has cold site response with peripheral ischemia in this patient, the, uh, the, uh, the one from the uveitis clinic. You, this will be on the differential diagnosis, but this is a CRB1 crumbs. So uh, a lot of the cold response in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, they turn out to a mutation in CRB1. So Sam, Sam Jacobson described the inner retina get thickened, but uh, in, in this condition, with the CRB1 gene is a, it, um, the gene is a, is a polymorph in our re, uh, retinal organization, but I don't know why they get the uh, parateriol sparing. Do they have deafness too? Because I have a patient like this, but who's also deaf, so I've been, I've been seeing usher with this response. But I don't do, do have mutation in CRB1? You usually typically not, don't have deafness, yeah, though. CR, have a yeah, CRB1. So this is a gene found in the fly, probably, probably in some kind of epithelial cell junction development in the fly. But in the context of time, I skip you through the, the, uh, the biology of uh, CRB1. So, so you can also cause, uh, uh, our people can also cause uh, labus uh, congenital amaurosis, depends on the mutation. So the cardinal feature is power arterial sparing, described by John Hacken Lively. So power arterial sparing. She likes to have coats like response. It was said that it can cause paravenous RP, but I, we, we, uh, I screen all my paravenous patients, but uh, they don't have a CRV1 mutation. But that's in the, in the literature. Does that, does that have a homogeneous pigmented proteins? No, the uh, CRV1 was described, but I think that one is just a SNP. So we cannot find any mutation in CRB1 in paravenous RP. So now, now we, we, we uh, just uh, diverge a little bit to, to show you the uh, labors and, and uh, as a segment to, to labors. And I go through them quickly because there's one more case at the end. Now this is in the, I think it's, I think it's the MoMA Metropolitan Museum. So this is probably a patient with labors. They, uh, they rub the eye, right? So the orbital fat atrophy, uh, Picasso painting. Typically, we, at least we, we try to do skin electro. We learn it from uh, Graham Holder and, uh, and uh, Dorothy Thompson. They, they do skin electro for labor, so they are pretty extinguished. And also in the context of time, I will, I will not tell you too much about the biology or different gene. I just try to show you the phenotype. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, th so these are my limited experience. Maybe also maybe Paul can chime in. You see this is a constant phenotype. So this is the station SEP290, uh, quite early one, they have a central uh, atrophy, and sometimes younger patients, you have dots. 
So CEP290, yellow dots in the peripheral retina, CEP290, formal labors. Sometimes they come with Joubert syndrome, but sometimes just CEP290. So, so these are all babies with, uh, with uh, labors, extinguished uh, ERG. Cyclase, one of, um, used to be Wolfgang's most favorite gene, but maybe not anymore. Cyclase typically have a normal fundus. So ERG is completely extinguished with a normal looking fundus in a baby. Cyclase will be very high in your differential. They are very photophobic as opposed to some other gene that I show you for cyclase. When they get older, they get a bit of uh, atrophy, salt and pep atrophy in the peripheral retina. The death will be a more typical form of uh, cyclase presentation. Some cyclase patients can be severe to get a central atrophy, but typically, typically the fundus can be normal. I showed you the phenotype for CRB1 already. CRX uh, is a transcription factor in, in, uh, in, the, in uh, embryogenesis, so they, they usually have funny looking fovea. Right? Maybe it's only some better picture. This will be more typical for they have a funny looking uh, affecting a fovea development, a macular development for CRX. And this is probably the only form of uh, labus early onset retinal dystrophy that are dominant, all the other ones are recessive. I'll skip through RP65 quickly in the context of time. RP65, the resident and fellows need to know because this one gene therapy is being done. And this is probably the only one together with uh, LRAT that you do not have fundus autofluorescence. So it is another one you can look at the patient, you know what gene it is. All the other forms of labors have, uh, or early onset retinal dystrophy would have autofluorescence. RP65 and L, uh, LRAT. And LRAT is so rare, I don't, haven't seen any. Do you have any LRAT patients here? No, in fact, we don't even have any RP65. RP65, yeah. Okay. So the, the, the typical description of RP65 is the salt and pepper retinopathy absence of fundus autofluorescent, and they like to stay at light as opposed to cyclase. The cyclase patients are very photophobic, and this patient, they like to stay at light. We eventually get some atrophy, but this is the classic salt and pepper retinopathy that you've seen in RP65. And just show you another, another patient is salt and pepper retinopathy. Let's skip through the, the uh, uh, gene there. When they get older, they, they, just, they, they just look like any other kind of RP patient when they get older. RP65. So a couple. Of, so just show you the classic salt and pepper retinopathy. RDX12 is uh, also a uh, very characteristic phenotype. In addition to ABCA4, I didn't show you any for Staga. You have peripeptous sparing of the RP. RP around the nerve is not affected. And it is kind of numnula round atrophy. I don't know why though, but this is very characteristic for RDX12, uh, retinal dehydrogenase. And you can see this kind of macular phenotype. There's no other gene will give you this kind of very round, nominal atrophy around the macula. So the, uh, a different patient, you can see that the, uh, the central macular finding is very characteristic for RDX12. And I think this is a gene that Robin Alley and uh, uh, Dorothy Thompson also tried to bring it to human treatment trial. And now the, the other eye, you can get this kind of, uh, the mac. The, the uh, peripheral fundus is not so specific, but the macular phenotype is very specific together with peripeplus sparing of the RPE. This is another patient. So you get, you get this kind of number round uh, uh, pigment in the center. ARPI1, this is a chaperone protein enfolding the phosphodiesterase. So very severe. They get a pretty much a central atrophy very early on as a newborn, newborn baby. And the retrophy enlarges over time. Skip through this. RPGR grip is uh, not, not so specific, but you get this uh, very, a lot of pigment quite early on as a baby. I want to go through at least one more interesting case. Okay, there may be two, two I can pass your pointer, there are two, two more cases before the hour. So this is from our, from our neighborhood. We have uh, more people that live in Washington Heights from Dominican Republic than in Dominican Republic. <laughs> so every time the election for president, well, all these booths set up around Washington Heights. So we have this kind of photo on the right eye, and it looks like in the
Yeah, so we did, we did some fluorescein at that point. Yeah, just the yeah, same patient, just window defect, and other part of the retina. So I will confess at this point, we don't know what she got, but she, she came back, she came back. <laughs> she came, and this is the fundus finding. <laughs> so anybody? She came. Same patient. Fairly preserved, the macula, I would say. And, and th you just look at this, a very sharp. sharp yeah. yeah, and then the left eye. Very similar Peripheral retina. Again, areas of, um, did not try to contour out here, but actually the type of Yeah, and then we have a different patient also in Washington Heights. That's the one to show you the, how the autofluorescent looks like. So what, what test will you do next? Or this patient. There's, there's very few treatable forms for retinal uh, degeneration, so residents should know. Well, what kind? Uh, so, so the problem is that uh, every time I order this test in New York Presbyterian Hospital, they don't know how to do it. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. and, you need to, uh, I need to go, there, go back a couple of times and tell them, I, I, I don't want the, red, the, the, red, the, the full panel. Hmm. Very good. Yeah, so, so the, you can, the, the, yeah, they have, they have, they have raised serum all in. This is gyrate atrophy. And the, if you, your patient are complying with this diet, uh, I haven't tried it myself, but I heard it tastes like cardboard. But, but, but if patients are complying with this diet, they completely you will stop the degeneration. This is one of the fields that, that, uh, that, that uh, we can treat. This is, a, this is a quick case, intermission, before the last interesting case. Anyone want to suggest? It would be easier if I tell you this patient came from the dermatology clinic, the right eye, left eye. They came from dermatology. It's a, it's a young girl. What do, you, what, what do you think of this? Yeah. It came from a dermatology clinic. Okay. So this, this is a Poudre Ranch. Poudre Ranch. Uh, this is an interesting patient that I actually share also with uh, people in Boston. Let me just go directly to the front. When you describe the fundus, this will be the last case before your, your hour. So this is a fundus filled with the right eye, looks like the nerve and vessels are proper, and then um, the macula has a uh, so tenial pigment here and some darker pigment fragments of the retina. Also the main center. More periphery. Yeah, hmm. the left eye. So this one, the what, what level do you think this lesion is? What level? What level? Mm -hmm. In the retina. What level? You can talk about periphery also. So what do you think happened before in the, in the right eye? So in a child, in a child, a young child, so I think he's six years old. So we have a mass here pushing up on the left eye. What do you think it used to be, or it had been? So for the resonant choroidal nevascularization in a child, there's a, li a limited number of differential. I can tell you this is what this is not is. You need to consider best for corridor neovascularization in a child, sometimes SOSB, but this patient does not have those. A trauma, corridor neovascularization in a child. This is the other differential for that. So 
Uh, not in children, though, I think. Yeah. So do you see all this? Not that high. You can do OCT finding, though. So what do you, what do you, what do you call, see this in the OCT? This, I think this corresponds to the white dots. I think these are photoreceptors, actually. So this, this patient actually uh, already been to Boston before uh, he came to New York to see me. So uh, they have a lot of uh, work up in, in Boston. And then, and then finally, uh, we did the ERG in New York. And, and then the, there was a textbook writer said that the patient have a bilateral dozen. Yeah, bilateral dozen. Dozen, dozen. dozen is diffused unilateral neural retinitis. The U, sub, uh, this diffused unilateral subacute neural retinitis. And the diagnosis from Boston was bilateral dozen. Bilateral. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so this, this was uh, from, uh, the diagnosis from a uh, textbook writer. So we did the ERG in New York. So, uh, so show you the so the normal trace is down right here. The normal trace. So this this is the the, the rod are extinguished. As you can see here, in the child, and the cone has special shape. Usually, the shape of the uh, maximal ERG is very different from the shape of the single flash cone ERG. In this patient, the shape is quite similar. This is a 30th flicker. And also notice another feature. Usually the A wave or single flash is quite small. And this way uh, it's smaller than the 30 hertz. In this patient, this uh, A wave is bigger than the 30 hertz. And there's no other gene will give you this feature. It was described by, I can tell you, uh, maybe it will help the clue. It was first described by Mike Marmer and, uh, and uh, uh, Peter Goros, the ERG feature. So rods are extinguished. So the, the, shape, the shape looks very similar to a single flash. Enhanced yes, <laughs> you should give the resident a chance. <laughs> okay, I'll go through this quickly. Yeah, so usually, usually the, a, the A wave it, uh, normally is uh, sm uh, smaller than the 30 hertz flicker, as I've shown previously. So you should, this is normal. A wave is much smaller than the 30 hertz. So, but in, the, in this patient, the, uh, the A wave is uh, uh, bigger than the 30 hertz flicker. This is a normal situation, and this is our patients. So this is our feature enhanced S cone. And then the, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, S cone uh, control from uh, the standard ERG is enough to make a diagnosis for icing in the cake. We did S cone ERG, but we don't have a lot of control for children. So a fellow volunteered his son for <laughs> the, the S cone ERG. So this is uh, my fellow's son, and this is uh, our, our patient. So this is enhanced S cone. So these, typically the rod responses are completely extinguished. The patient no rod. Usually I tell the, the, the children that you have enhanced S cone syndrome. Your, your retina looks like a dinosaur's retina, right? The dinosaur's retina don't have any uh, rods. And this patient have a homozygous mutation in this transcription factor, NL2E3. Uh, homozygous. So you should be able to, in older patient, they, I'll show you the picture, the fundus is more characteristic in older patient. They, they have a numnular pigment around the arcade. And, and then uh, we, the, the something new is here that the, uh, we, we found that this, they have this uh, kind of retina rosettes shown in here. We can skip through this. So in mice, you get this kind of rosettes in enhanced S cone, RD7 mouse. You get lots of white dots also in mice. So you get this folded rosette. And this is, it looks like the same as our patient. So the patient have the, 
Uh, let's see. So th this, this, I think, interpreted is the same kind of rosette. You saw it, it uh, as, in, as in, this is a mouse retina. When they get older, they, 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 they become flatter, degenerate. So these are, the, uh, these are actually macrophage, the little, little dots here, and then the round ones are rosettes, as long, uh, just like in the mouse. And when, so in, in, this, these are typically very round pigment, and the level of pigment is at the RPE level. They don't have pigment migration. Let's see some more. And RP patients typically have a, a high density ring, and, and in enhanced X cone, you get kind of a, a amorphous uh, ring uh, in the macula. And also, RP patient, you don't get ring on the nasal side. In enhanced X cone, you also got on the nasal side also in the retina. Just show you some other pictures of enhanced X cone. This is an older patient. You get this round, nominal pigment. So these are, these are very round, and they're subretinal. Most of the patients with retinitis pigmentosa has sharp edges, and that most of the pigment are intraretinal. But in enhanced as cone, these patients are subretinal. Sometime on the uh, referral letter, they said, that, oh, patients don't have diabetes, but the, the comprehensive ophthalmologist will write that. that they look like, they don't know, it looks like the patient got PRP scars, but they don't have diabetes. They don't know why. So they send the patient in. So typically, because you don't have enhanced S cone, this, the transcription factor is required to convert the cones, to push the cone fate into rods. So you don't have the transcription factor for the enhanced S cone gene. All your, all your retina become cones, but, and there's no rod. And that's why they, they are not, not blind. It's the same gene as uh, goldman farré syndrome. Eventually, they get a lot of uh, uh, vitreous changes, and it gets skysis. So this is just the same gene, and then that's called goldman farré I'll go to the conclusion slide, let's see. So just looking, I show you examples uh, this morning, just looking at the patient. In many cases, you can just look at the patient, you know what residue. So ophthalmology is uh, unusual compared to medicine, because in internal medicine, you can only, medium victim acute can only find out two conditions, achondroplasia. Every patient with achondroplasia, pretty much is going to have a mutation in the 380 residue for the fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. Uh, you make a diagnosis of progeria, then you're going to know the patient is going to have a mutation in the laminate uh, A gene in 1824 residue. I show cases including uh, enhanced S-Cone syndrome, and there's a, there's a long list of disorder. You look at the patient in the combination of imaging, ADHO diagnostic testing, you, can know, you, can, you cannot tell which residue, but you can narrow down which gene. So doing one single gene testing, it took you like $200 clear, te clear testing. Whole, whole exome sequencing, clear testing, will, will typically cost you like $6,000. So now you can uh, uh, help you to target DNA screening instead of just doing whole genome or whole exome sequencing. Knowing your gene give patient better prognosis, allow presymptomatic testing and carrier detection. And this all this is because in the future, gene therapy is likely to be uh, gene specific. And then also we can now determine what gene would play, even with pharmacological treatment, then maybe we can determine uh, what gene that uh, uh, tre uh, would be more treatable. And so we learn more and more that we can get better genotype and phenotype correlation. The many genes can cause retinal degeneration. I show you uh, in the case of uh, pattern macular dystrophy, you make the diagnosis with this speckled autofluorescent. You know there's going to be RDS peripheral at the 172 residue. Atrophic areata is going to be the TNET gene, 421 residue. Maternally inherited diabetes and deafness is going to be the tRNA leucine gene, 
as the mitochondrial 3243 residue. Doin honeycomb malaria is going to be fibrillin 3, 345 uh, residue. Late onset retinal degeneration is going to be CTRP5 gene. And uh, in the other cases, you can tell uh, what gene, and you can focus your screening. So this is one of the uh, uh, ophthalmology is one of the few areas in medicine. You can look at the patient, and you can tell what gene. Uh, I suppose a lot of the in pediatrics and in neurology, they're moving toward whole, whole, gene, whole exome genome sequencing as a diagnostic, primary diagnostic tool, because they, when they look at the patient, they cannot tell what gene the patient got. But in ophthalmology, most, many cases, we can tell the patient what gene, so we can focus your gene screening. That's why you can start doing genotyping in your own clinic this afternoon. <laughs> of course, we see cases like that every day. <laughs> Everybody is invited. We have, we have a course in January. We have about 60 residents from all over the country. And different people have come and teach, teach our uh, course in January. We have uh, Dr. Jabs, uh, Marco, Peter Gross, Don DeMico come to teach, Graham Holder, Yaji, uh, Joe Dima, Ralph Eagle, Alan comes to teach in January. Uh, Larry Teach also, but Tom Sackma, and, uh, even Mike Woodrop came, but, he, but uh, all, all, all the, all, uh, all the uh, speakers are based on cost evaluation. Uh, resident did not like photo transduction. <laughs> so, we, so we didn't have that. Uh, we, don't have, we, don't, we didn't have uh, Tom Sackma and, and Mike Woodrop came back to teach anymore. <laughs> Oliver Sachs used to teach also, Andy Lee. Tony Moore and Irene Mormony all come to teach also. Elizabeth Angle also came to teach our course, Ian McDonald. So many people, so we all, you, you, to return for your hospitality, all the residents and fellows are invited to come also to our course in January. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I'd like yeah. to ask a question. How about, um, I think those views that you presented are really nice in that there is like a great one-to-one between the same relation. What about those views, for example, the pattern dystrophy as a whole, and there is not a one-to-one relation? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so, so we always look at the family, right? Because yeah, your differential will include, sometimes there's some overlap between stargat and pattern dystrophy. So look at the family first to see this established is dominant or, or recessive. And then uh, you do the most likely gene first, which is LDS. If it's negative, you can consider do a retina panel. If that's still negative, then you can do whole, gene, uh, whole exome sequencing, or whole genome sequencing, so as a backup. But there's still cases that we, 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 we with, uh, at least with whole exome sequencing, we can now probably solve about 80% of our cases, though. Yeah. We still are rarely using whole exome right now. Most of our patients are using that. Yeah, so, uh, so whole exome sequencing depends on insurance. So, uh, New, York, New York, New Jersey, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you can get them done pretty easily. Aetna is quite difficult to get whole exome sequencing done. Yeah. But the, the National Health Service, the uh, National Healthcare, is doing, uh, offering whole genome sequencing as a pilot study uh, for 100,000 patients, and many of the more fused patients already got, gotten the whole genome sequencing already. So sometimes national healthcare can be good. <laughs> yeah. I think in Germany, also do a lot of whole, whole exome sequencing, also covered by, the, by uh, private insurance. Thank you. Thank you.